What when Bible? I, when I read? Yes. Uh, I have American Standard or New American Standard. Just because um, that's just what I've had. Um, I, I I only asked that because last week when you read uh, about three or four sentences in, I was completely lost. I'm going, what is she reading? What's she reading from? Yeah, it was one one of my my professors. That was his favorite version at the time because you have to remember that was over fifty years ago, and so I just still had the, that version, so I grabbed it. Versions of the Bible. All right, it is six o'clock, and I know Caroline's out of town, so not everyone got an email reminding. So if it's just us, it's just us, and that'll be awesome because you don't need a ton of people to get into Revelation 19 and find it to be fascinatingly, strangely awesome. Uh, let's let's pray. Good and gracious God, as we continue to navigate this. Most mysterious of scripture. This piece that the author, having received a vision from you and somehow or another, his sheer knowledge of our tradition. Well, he was able to weave together this tapestry of hope, wonder, fear, even despair, so much more. I don't know how he was able to do it. But often when we talk about you, God, we try to limit you, try to describe you, try to say just what you are. Remind us as we go through these words that you are infinite. And thereby, you contain that which we cannot possibly conceive of. With knowledge of this great mystery, Grant that we see, hear, and experience that which you wish us to know. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I always like it when I pray and open my eyes and there's more people. <laughs> it's, it's, like a, it's like a miracle. You all are miracles. All right. Revelation 19. That means last week we did Revelation 18, which, by the way, if we do a, a chapter a week, uh, we'll be done with Revelation in just over three weeks, like three weeks in an hour. And, uh, and, and some people thought it would never happen. <laughs> I don't actually think that. I'm sure some people just thought it would happen faster. Anyway, um, if you recall, we are in what I am calling and what has been called by others, the seven visions. And uh, we did visions uh, one, two, three, and four already. Vision one was chapter 17. Vision two, three, two, three, four was chapter 18. And today we're going to get into visions five and six. And again, if we remember enough of these sevenfold series, what should we expect after the sixth vision? A break. Yeah. A break, an interlude. Yes, well done. I, 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 even those who are muted, bow the right thing. And that's wonderful that you you know that. I'm so glad. I was so terrified someone was going to say the seventh. And I would be like, oh, we've only been doing this since January. Let's start again. And um, no, no. So we'll have an interlude and then we'll get into the seventh vision, which is the culmination of, of all things. It's stunning. But uh, we're not there yet. And, and uh, what did we see last week? Does anyone remember anything about what we saw last week and what that was like for you? It was the fall of Babylon and the merchants and the kings all backing away to watch from a distance as it was destroyed. We certainly had that piece of like, everyone's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch you be destroyed from a distance and if you're anything like me every time you say from a distance you start having Bette Midler in your head and uh that'll never go away that will never go away I was very young when that song came out and so like it's instilled in the inner parts of my unconscious and subconscious and consciousness even 
that's some kind of unholy trinity of consciousness that is doing strange things. Um, anyway, yeah, so there's from a distance and there's violence and there's destruction and there's all sorts of things like that. And, and, and we talk of all this violence, but again, what do we keep discerning about the violence we discover in Revelation? Is it God just being a terrible tyrant? No, it was about his justice. Even though that whole 18 was, I thought, very depressing. Just It totally was depressing. Why? Because, I mean, even oh. amid like that fourth sign, when heaven seems to be grieving and lamenting the destruction of all of this. And, and there's something important that we have to understand about that. God doesn't want to see any of this be destroyed or anything of that nature. That's not what God wills for these things. Um, while simultaneously uh, the, the universe is made in such a way that, uh, you know, again, justice will come for you one way or another. Um, it just does. Uh, isn't that the whole the whole point of crime and punishment? Anybody enjoy reading crime and punishment back in the day? Anyone read crime and punishment back in the day? No Dostoevsky fans around here? People are like, I was a Tolstoy fan. Give me some Anna Karina, but not crime and punishment for the love of God. Um, crime and punishment. What a brilliant novel brilliant novel um again someone commits a crime they're being punished simply by their conscience before they ever get to the place of uh being caught for what they've done there's a truth to that novel it's one of the reasons why we still make high school students read it uh neither here nor there after all of this violence and things we're going to dive into 19 and the first thing we're going to see is worship and that's fun so let's actually just read 19 and then we'll get into slides and we'll make Eric? all this work yeah. Garrett, on 18, was there anything to be made about the reference? I think it was at least twice, maybe, where it said uh, all this happened in one hour. It means a very short period of time, like everything, nothing's lasting forever. So like if anyone were to take this kind of uh, sense of like, oh, this is God's hell. Look what God's doing to them. Uh, some eternal punishment. No, it's a battle. It's over. It's done. Um, there's a finality to the end of evil and the fight to do it is like that. Now, an hour is not um, an actual hour. It's symbolic as we have been having endless symbolism uh, take place throughout the whole of the book. Yeah, Does that, that help? That, that kind of stopped me too, um, Steve and, and Garrett, because the first part of it about the nations, it said in one day, but then when they did the kings and the merchants and the captains and the whatever, then it turned into one hour. So it was like, everything was like speeding up. Yeah, it all speeds up. And, and again, look, think of it symbolically. If you see the collapse of something and you're like, oh, it's collapsing. And, and doesn't the collapse always feel like it starts going faster at the end of it? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Like, uh, like if uh, yeah, there's so many uh, examples, uh, but think of the amount of movies you've seen where you have some character. Anyone seen the movie, There Will Be Blood? Okay, don't use that example. Um, I can't think of any other, I mean, there's, I know there's plenty of examples in cinema though, where you have some kind of main character of the movie who is of questionable morality at best. Mm -hmm. And everything's kind of going well for them and you hate that it's going well for them a little bit because they're terrible people. And about in the second act of the movie, things start to collapse around them. And you can feel like uh, everything they've done is starting to come back to haunt them. And then toward the end of the third act of the movie, it suddenly all goes to H-E double hockey sticks and one fell swoop. Does that make any sense, what I just said? Yeah, it kind of makes me picture um, visually like when you watch them imploding a building where all of a sudden it's gradual and then it's like kaboom, it all falls apart, yeah. Yeah. And so a little bit of the symbolism of going from a day to an hour kind of like that is one, it, over and over again, John has been using very delineated periods of time that are short in the whole scheme of things when talking about 
the rule of evil and the destruction of evil. So these short periods of time are symbolic that they don't last forever. They cannot last forever. Um, the rule of evil can't last forever. It was getting three and a half years. Um, like, and that's kind of that piece of things when we kept going through those cycles, uh, 1,260 days. And then this destruction in these visions, one day, one hour, it's just like, it's, it's, it's quick. And the quickness of it is demonstrating not just the finality of evil, but God's absurd quickness of unleashing the judgment and having the judgment be final. This isn't a, a, a courtroom scene. This isn't like, this is the end of it all. This is God being like, there's a finality to it. And it's very quick. And it feels like to the people as it's going, it gets quicker toward the end. Much like, how? let me try this. Anyone ever had a guilty conscience? <laughs> yeah. Did your guilty conscience creep up on you and then you're like, oh, oh, I'm going to get caught for whatever reason you think you might get caught. And then as you were getting closer to getting caught, maybe you were a child, maybe you did something as an adult that you still don't want anyone to know about because God forbid we know about it, we might judge you. And, and, and yet you kind of got there and you get caught and it's all at the end and you're like, ah, it's all falling apart at once. Like, um, you know, like sometimes that guilty conscious, it, it's just knocking on the door. And sometimes it busts down the door and everything falls apart. Um, so don't take anything literal in Revelation. Ever. It wasn't meant to be taken literally. So if you're a biblical literalist, you will literally not understand Revelation at all. <laughs> Because it's not a history book, and it's not a book foretelling 2,000 years from the time it was written. It's an apocalypse, which is the style of literature from its time. And it's also a prophecy and a Christian prophecy. And we have to understand prophets is speaking for God. And we'll actually figure that out a little bit as we go through 19. Anyway, I'm 12 minutes through. Am I belaboring that point enough that it makes sense? Or do you want me to beat the dead horse some more? No, good. Let's read 19. Um, anyone want to read uh, verses 1 through verse 10? We're going to go through the whole worship scene. It's the ten verse, first 10 verses of chapter 19. Yeah. I, go ahead, Gary. I, I like to, Absolutely. I, I've been absent for a while. I'd like to read, okay? If, <clears throat> am I on? Yeah, okay. Yes, you After, are. Yeah. After this, I heard what seemed to be the mighty voice of a great multitude in heaven, crying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who is seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice crying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty thunder peals, crying, hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage, supper of the Lamb, and said to me, these are true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All wow. right. So that is the sixth vision or fifth vision. I'm sorry. Fifth vision. How was that for everybody? 
a little bit better. Yeah, great. <laughs> Um, I, I just had a quick question. Um, I I'm reading the NIV version, and when we get to eight, where it talks about the fine linen, uh -huh. uh, it puts it in parentheses. And I didn't, I think the way Gary wrote it or read it made sense because I was thinking, is that parentheses, is that something John's saying? Or is that like a way of whoever's translating the Bible is explaining it? It just seemed peculiar to, to have that line in parentheses. The parentheses, I, because I'm looking at the NRSV. Uh, Gary, were you in the RSV? So, like, I think I'm in a I'm in a different translation completely than both of you. So, when you say parentheses, are you talking about the full of verse eight, or the second half of verse eight, or the first half of verse eight? Um, I'm I'm seeing the part where it says fine linen, bright and clean was given to her to wear. And then it has parentheses. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. So it's almost oh, okay. like this little insert. And it's like, who put that there? Did John put that there? You know, so that is one of the problems with uh, translating the Bible. Uh -huh. um, in my version the the quote ends before the parentheses in in your version and so my version showing it is the side without the parentheses your version <laughs> is showing it is the side with the parentheses and and can, it, what was in the parentheses of yours again grace i'm sorry it says fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints it's like oh it's like inserting a definition yeah and and like and, and it is so it's that it's it's it, it sounds like John providing the definition of the symbolism that John is giving. Okay. Um, so like, hey, what's fine linen mean? This bride has been granted to fine linen, bright and pure. And the fine linen is the righteous deeds, acts of the saints. And so saying, John, we'll come to find out when we get into the slides that uh, the Greek should not be translated righteous deeds or righteous acts of the saints. It should be translated righteousness of the saints, which may or may not thereby come from Christ. It's more like grace as opposed to uh, the actual acts. But that's neither here nor there either. We can't even figure out how to translate it right. And if we can't figure out how to translate it right, what does that mean for us? We can't be certain of some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. We do our best. Mm -hmm. And again, if we can't figure out how to translate it right, let's also remember this still wasn't for us. Do you really think John, who was exiled on Patmos, writing to seven churches that were symbolic to him of the fullness of the church in the Roman Empire at the time, was expecting us nearly 1900 years later or more to be on Zoom on August the 24th of the year 2022 of our Lord talking about what he wrote <laughs> to people who were going through the issues of the Roman Empire. No. no, and if he knew that we were speaking a language called English, he'd be like, what? So let's just that we're distantly removed from this and we're going to do our best. But okay. yes, okay, let's read. Someone read uh, the, the, the sixth vision, which is verses 11 through the end of the chapter, verse 21. I can do that. Thank you. And, and just for Steve, I'm not reading from my American standard, so you might understand it might be easier this time. Won't lose that, me. Okay, yeah, I don't want to lose you. Then I saw heaven opened and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the enemies of armies of heaven wearing fine linen, white and pure were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. 
On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly to mid heaven, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses and their riders, flesh of all, both free and slave, both small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gather to make war against the rider on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who had performed in its presence the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire <coughs> that burns with sulfur and the rest were killed by the sword of the rider on the horse, the sword that came from his mouth and, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Amen. That's less joyful maybe than the, uh, the worship and the, the wedding of the lamb. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, birds but, gorging themselves on flesh. But we'll talk about but, that. Maybe not as but awful doesn't as that, we think when we first read it. Doesn't that hark back to Leviticus and how worship was done in Leviticus? Burned. It, and then eaten uh, burned and eaten and i mean there is you can i i hadn't actually thought about that with regards to that piece um but what's interesting to me is i didn't think about it either um when i was doing my study until uh, gary read verse three and verse three had that piece where once more they said hallelujah the smoke goes up from her forever and ever and that smoke of the uh, of the of that was always going from the offerings in the in the temple or the tabernacle of Leviticus that had to keep happening. Now that that smoke is going up from the great whore forever and ever. And I was like, oh, she's a sacrifice. And I hadn't thought about that when I saw this. And then so when you then said that about the the other piece too, that's fascinating to me. Um, and you know what? I haven't read in any commentary either of those pieces talking about Levitical worship um, in that. So I, I can't comment much on that from any scholarly piece because I haven't read a scholar talk about it. But I will say this. While I have not read a scholar talk about that, if if us, the, the 12 of us, the 13 of us, how many ever are here, whoever's watching on Facebook, if having gone through Leviticus and Revelation in the last year and a half, we can read this and start seeing things that I haven't read any scholar write, <laughs> we're friggin' awesome. <laughs> so uh, well done, everybody. Well done. Anyway, okay, cool. So let's play and uh, and 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 see what happens a little bit. We'll we'll go into these fifth and sixth visions and we'll try to uh, make them make some sense to us. The fifth vision is the hallelujah course. I like calling it that because anyone count how many times hallelujah is said? No. No, that's all right. We'll talk about it in a second. Seven. And the <laughs> marriage of the lamb. What a lovely vision. So after these four visions that we had that were devoted to the description, um, to a description of the great city and its fall, John has this glorious vision of heavenly worship again. And, and again, are we all familiar with visions of heavenly worship going on in Revelation now? Like we've seen this. Okay, cool. So this is not new. Now a key structural element is the word hallelujah, which doesn't appear in the New Testament very often. And hallelujah is a transliteration of the word that is in Hebrew, which means praise Yahweh. Did anyone already know that about hallelujah? No, no. no. Yeah, hallelujah means praise Yahweh. So now you know. And, um, and so every time someone says hallelujah out loud, uh, irrespective of their religiosity, um, they are in fact praising the ancient God of the Jews. Yeah, I like that. So let's keep singing 
Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, everybody. Um, now, three times it's shouted by the vast multitude of the redeemed. And that's in verse 1, 3, and 6. And once by the 24 elders and the six, four living creatures. That's in verse 4. Now, that's interesting. God's salvation, glory, power, and just judgment immediately call forth natural praise and profound reverence. And we see this very similar kind of worship in chapter 7 and chapters 11 of Revelation as well. When we've encountered some of these things happening and then John experiences some kind of heavenly worship where the worship is in response to what God is doing um, here. And the destruction of the great whore is cause for celebration and praising God, even after there was some lamentable part at the end of chapter 18. So there's both lament and praise in God. What does it mean to any of us that lament and praise in God can coexist? Reminds well, me of Job, that that in our sorrows we can still praise Him, right? And so we have that piece of in our sorrows we can still pray. And I just appreciate that the praise is honest. Myself, like heaven laments what is happening to the great whore, and yet at the same point in time it rejoices. It laments that it has to happen and it rejoices that justice is being done. That's a whole lot different than vengeance, no? Mm -hmm. Right. Does yeah. vengeance ever lament that it has to happen? No. And it's rejoice and that it's being done is never just because it never lamented. Anyway. I find that interesting, and I like watching that. Now, the joyous worship service concludes with the marriage of the Lamb. I won't go into a lot of the pieces of all these things, because we've talked about a lot of what this worship's going on already and all of these things. But the marriage of the Lamb is, is the big piece as well. And the imagery that begins in uh, 7 and 9 with regards to this marriage thing, it rests upon three themes that I just, I've been saying this since January. More than two thirds of the book of Revelation has direct references to the Old Testament. Yeah. I keep harking on that because, or harping on that, I should say, because I want people to know this isn't mm -hmm. out of left field. It's not his imagination making it up. He's utilizing his tradition. So now these see three themes that we see in these three verses. One, believers as God's bride or wife. Are we familiar with this in scripture before revelation? And the yeah. answer is, yeah. Yes. We see it in Jeremiah 2, 2, when God says, you've been like a bride to me. Notice that I just wrote down Hosea. <laughs> Anyone know the book of Hosea? No. Good There's a to... reason I wrote yeah. down just Hosea. Yeah. Because the whole prophet of Hosea is talking about the people of God as being a bride or a wife and an adulterous wife at that. In 2 Corinthians, Paul's already talking about that. Ephesians, probably not written by Paul. That's not the point. Again, it's being mentioned that the church is like a bride. Now, the second theme that we see are clean garments for a symbol of purity. Have we seen that before in the Old Testament? And maybe you're like, I don't really know. I, I, I have never really thought about clean garments as a symbol for purity before. But it's in Genesis 35, verse 2, Isaiah 52, verse 1, 62, verse 20, and Zechariah 3, 4, all simultaneously. I'm not going to have us read those. You cannot trust me, but you can look them up and find out that I wasn't lying. Clean garments are a symbol for purity. And the Genesis one as well is actually changing into clean garments to be before people who are pure. It's a wonderful kind of thing. The third theme that we see in this joyous worship that concludes in the marriage of the lamb is the reign of God is a great feast. Are we comfortable with that, Christian people? 
Yeah. Well, Why would we be very comfortable with the reign of God being a great feast? Communion. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. <laughs> I mean, when you walk into our sanctuary and you look through the narthex and you see the thing, what is the first thing if you're looking down and you look up? What's the first thing you see in the middle of the sanctuary? Communion table. The communion table. Why is the first thing that anyone sees in the sanctuary if they've gone looking down to up the communion table? Because for us, the reign of God is still represented as a great feast. What's the only miracle that happens in all four Gospels? Feeding of the multitudes. The feeding of the 5,000. Only miracle that happens in all four Gospels. What does that mean? It means something about a great feast. Isaiah 35, 6, already was talking in the Old Testament about this idea of the reign of God being a great feast. Matthew 22 shows it. 25 shows this whole kind of idea as well. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Are, are people waiting for the bride to show up so there can be, a, or bridegroom to show up for there to be a great feast? Luke 14 has the same kind of idea. And so I'm just pointing out these three themes that are long before John's time. Now, two aspects of the wedding of the lamb, I think, merit closer attention. The first, scholars disagree over the proper translation of the last clause of 19.8. Aren't you glad we're talking about this, Grace? Yeah. Oh, wow. How about that? Amen. Okay. So, like, more. <laughs> even as you see that in parentheses, there's a lot of disagreement about how to translate this last clause, the second half of verse eight. So part of the way you might see it in that isn't just that it's an aside by John, but they may not be sure, the people who came up with the new, new international version may not be sure they feel comfortable with their translation. And sometimes it'll be bracketed because they're not sure. Oh. Um, but I, I haven't seen that much, and I'm not positive about that. So I, you can quote me on that. But if someone's like, oh, he's wrong, I'll, maybe I'm wrong. Um, some translate it, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. That's how the NRSV translates it. And this translation focuses on the importance of believers' deeds. Um, they compose the, they, not the, um, the deeds compose the wedding dress. Um, Okay, again, this is symbolic, mm. but that means you're clothed in what you've done. Um, uh -huh. Does that sound very Protestant to us? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a big deal there. That has to do with actions versus yeah. being made righteous through Jesus. And so us Protestants are all like, ah, oh, wait about faith alone, works alone, or faith alone, scripture alone, grace alone. And, uh, and uh, you can have that. Other scholars pointing to the first clause, because the first clause says to her, it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. So notice that where the passive voice indicates in the first clause that the bride received the dress as a gift. Those scholars argue that the last clause should be translated as follow for the fine linens is the righteousness of the saints. Now, maybe it's righteous deeds, maybe it's righteousness. Uh, the translation is also supported by the fact that nowhere else is the Greek word referred to deeds. On the contrary, it's a pronouncement of righteousness, the one that is translated righteous deeds there. So like, why are we translating it righteous deeds? Because it's easy to translate it that way as well. And when something gets stuck in our mind, we keep doing the same thing. And moreover, in both in chapter seven and for uh, chapter seven, just chapter seven, verses nine and 14, the robes of the multitude were made white by the blood of the lamb. So there's something going on here and we're not sure how to make it work. Is it Christ's righteousness or our righteousness? Now, the Protestant would say, Christ's righteousness. Christ's righteousness. Now, other versions of Christianity might say our righteousness. Can it be both? If, for instance, we are made clean by the proverbial blood of the lamb, as Revelation is saying, and we are dressed in white linen because of 
Christ's righteousness as a gift, and yet simultaneously, that has to be our deeds. Can that paradox exist in our minds without it breaking apart, or is that part of the joy of grace? Is grace ever grace if we're not doing some kind of deed to make the grace appear like it's actually working? Don't you know that's where the Protestant work ethic comes from? In an effort to prove that they were actually saved, people worked hard to make sure that it looked like they were actually saved. Because that's what Calvin said, you can tell the difference for. How do you know who's predestined for salvation and who's predestined for damnation? Calvin's like, because one acts like they're predestined for one and one acts like they're predestined for the other. Long story short, it's never just been a faith statement that saves us. It's a life lived that is the salvation. And maybe this whole lack of understanding in verse eight is helping us to realize we still have to do something. And we do. I hope everybody at least believes it. Second, there's a beatitude. Anyone remember how many beatitudes are found in Revelation? Beatitudes being... Uh, in here, blessed are those. So blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's a beatitude. Anyone remember how many beatitudes are in Revelation? You shouldn't be surprised by the number. Seven. 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 Well done. There's seven beatitudes in Revelation. Coincidence? I kind of doubt it, but I'm not sure how John would have made sure they were all spaced apart the way they are and still there would be seven. But there was. That Beatitudes raise some questions for interpreters as well. If the bride is the people of God, then who are those invited to the wedding? Oh. <laughs> hmm. Now, I said toward the beginning of our time together, never take revelation literally, ever, ever, ever. Because this question only arises from a literal reading of the text. Now, Christ is both the lamb and the shepherd. We see that in chapter 7, verse 17. Can you have a lamb and a shepherd exist simultaneously? Does that make any sense? Not really, but right there it's so. And can we, do we understand Christ as lamb and shepherd simultaneously in our minds? Sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, we've all been indoctrinated in Christianity long enough. We're like, yes, Christ is the lamb. Yes, Christ is the shepherd. We'll also say Christ is the lion. And Christ is the... It's all insane. So again, here, the people of God collectively are the bride and individually are the wedding guests. You just get to play with the absurdity. And I like this quote by Caird. John is the master of his medium and not its slave. He can use his symbols with complete freedom from any literalness. And in case that quote seems not to make all that sense, he can do whatever he wants without having to go and make you happy. <laughs> so here, the people of God are the bride, is the bride, if you will. And simultaneously, individually, we're all the wedding guests. And it's kind of fun just to play with the whole absurdity. Now, this is an interesting vision, and I'm going to move to the end. But at the conclusion of this vision, a rather curious event transpires. And what is even more curious is that it reoccurs in chapter 22. John attempts to worship his angelic guide. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. Anybody find that strange? Mm -hmm. No. Now, He's immediately prohibited from it. You notice how the angel was like, don't, no, 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 no. But why after everything he experienced, would he do such a thing? Now in Colossians 2.18, we learned that there were Christians in Asia Minor who were drawn to angel worship. Did you know that? No, because most of us, when we read something like that, we just kind of move right by it. And no clergy person is gonna take time in a service of, proclamation of the gospel to talk about how there were people in the first century AD who really liked to worship angels. But we're not in a service of the Lord's day. We're in a Bible study. So now I'm telling you, it was not necessarily uncommon. And maybe John is simply attacking that practice. 
Now, there's obvious differences between angels and people, but as the angel points out, both are servants of God. The angel is not God. John is showing through the way of being a negative example. What do I mean by negative example? I remember when I was uh, probably three years into my time in my first call in Georgia. I'd done two years in various African-American churches in the Bay Area. Now I'm in Georgia, the Diane White Church. And, and my examples, my stories, I was almost, all, I was actually always, I was, if I used myself in a story, I was the, I was the one learning. I was the one who did wrong. I was never a hero of my story. Why was I never a hero of my own story and sermons? Well, isn't that the, the most obnoxious thing you could ever hear from a preacher? <laughs> Look how great I am. Well, I finally had someone say, are you really as horrible as your sermons make you out to be? <laughs> so I, I, I backed away from that a little bit. But here's John doing the very thing that people shouldn't be doing. So he's using himself as a negative example because if he's learning not to worship angels and he's sending his letter out to Asia Minor where we already know there are people trying to worship angels and he's trying to do it and is told by an angel not to do it, is that a lot easier way of someone saying maybe I shouldn't do that other than John saying by the way don't worship angels you fools hmm. yes it's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. but it's also demonstrating that worshiping a beast is not the only form of idolatry one can also engage in idolatry by worshiping something good but the good isn't God what are some forms of worshiping something good in place of God that we still do Work. Work? Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. I said work. God God knows we worship work. Money. Money. It's not, I mean, it's, love of money is the root of all evil. I don't know if money itself is good or evil. So. Let me try one that might be a shocker. How where, about the Bible? Where would where would Mary fall into this conversation? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Talk to Protestants, and let's will tell you that she falls right smack dab into the middle of this conversation. Talk to Catholics, and they'll be like, what do you mean the mother of God can't be venerated? Um, and then we get into a whole conversation about worship versus veneration. Um, but again, I'm going to suggest the Bible. There are Christians that worship the Bible. Yeah. And that is a form of idolatry that even has a name. It's called idolatry, Where you're suddenly like, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, it's the word of God. It's a narrative. It has no problems. It can tell you everything. And the, meaning, the moment it tells me, like, someone's like, everything you ever need to know is in the Bible. I'm like, tell me what it says, two plus two equals one. <laughs> and they're like, well, it's just like, the Bible is not God. At its best, holy scriptures are a finger pointing to the sun. And it asks us to look toward where it's pointing, not to look at the finger and call it the sun. And by sun, I meant S-U-N, the bright burning thing in the sky that's nearly impossible to miss. Anyway, enough of all of that. Now, the last line in verse 10 sets up the next vision. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, this expression can mean either the testimony that Jesus bore or the testimony born to Jesus by believers. That doesn't matter. It's the spirit of prophecy that guides the interpretation for the next vision. And that's going to be important um, because we need to remember something about Jesus as we go through reading all about birds eating the flesh off things. And I mean this, by the way, my friends. John gives us the interpretive lens through which to look at the next vision at the end of this vision. And we still have to look at things through the lenses of Christ. Because if we don't, we're not paying attention the way Christ wants us to. Sixth vision, the victorious word of God. Now, the preceding vision prepares the reader for the appearance of the bridegroom. But as is often the case in Revelation, a surprise awaits. 
Wouldn't you just love that the bridegroom showed up and that was that? You'd be like, oh, five visions. We're at the end. Thanks be to God. And the sixth vision happens and we get a white horse. A white horse is symbolic of victory. And do we ever hear that it's Christ on the horse or do we just know because we know? This is this is Christ on the horse. This is the, the, the victorious risen Christ going forth. Now, there's several of John's descriptions that have parallels elsewhere in Revelation because that's what John does. For example, we see here in verse 11, its rider is called faithful and true. In verse 5 of chapter 1, Jesus is called the faithful one. In verse 7 of chapter 3, he's called the true one. So now John is taking things that he's already used to call Jesus, and he's putting them together. He has eyes like flame of fire. Have we seen that before in Revelation? And if you don't yes. remember chapter 1 and chapter 2, let me just tell you, yes, we have. Who has eyes of flame and fire like fire? Jesus Cristo. I don't know why I had to say that in Spanish, but um, maybe I'm feeling Pentecostal. Now, first Christ judges and makes war in righteousness. Did you know that righteousness in the New Testament can always be translated justice? <laughs> now you do. The word righteousness in Greek can always be translated justice. Um, so... Christ judges and makes war in righteousness or in justice, which means he's not doing this out of vindictiveness or revenge. And in this respect, Christ stands in sharp contrast to the four horsemen, or at least the first horseman of the apocalypse that we see in chapter 6, verse 2, when that horseman is certainly motivated by the lust of military conquest. What is motivating Jesus? Is it military conquest? No, it's justice. Whereas the dragon has seven diadems or crowns. And the reason I use diadems and not crowns is when I use diadems, I'm talking about like a royal crown. And when I use crown, I'm talking about a victory wreath in the Greek. So there, there, in Revelation, we see both of those words used. When you see crown in Revelation, it's normally the victory wreath. And when you see diadem, it's like the crown that a king or queen wears. So we're using diadems right now. The dragon has seven diadems. If you remember, meaning it has kind of like, com like this perfect power, or so we think, because seven's the perfect number. And the beast has 10 diadems, which is complete power and this kind of idea of things. Now, Christ wears, anyone remember what it says? Well, I haven't written right there, but in verse 12, he wears many diadems. What's better than seven and 10? Many. <laughs> Many. What does it mean by many? What do you think John's trying to tell? He's shown a dragon with perfect power. He's shown a beast with complete power. They seem overwhelming. And now he shows a risen Christ with lots and lots and lots of power. Christ's royalty and majesty surpass everybody else's. Now, the statement that his name is known only to himself is super significant. And I'm going to tell you a couple of pieces. First, among first century magicians, knowledge of a person's name gave the magician power over that person. Anyone know that? No. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why, like, if, like, you, even so, what do we still say? Uh, if you're on the internet and you're in some kind of chat room or, uh, message board or something should you ever use your real name are we told no no and why not gives them power over you maybe they'll get power over you exactly like that's the thing um you can do that now also anyone remember what is genesis 22 or 32 i'm sorry if you remember what genesis 32 is at the top of your head you get the star of the day That's all right. We're not Baptists. You're allowed to look up your Bible. 
because we learned how to read. Anyway, I didn't mean to say that. <sighs> I'm going to take that back. Yes, the yawn is appropriate for what I just said. I apologize. But whoever yawned, thank you. That was God's judgment upon me. <laughs> Genesis 32 is when Jacob wrestles with God. And do you remember toward the end of the wrestling match, what Jacob was asking God or the divine messenger when the divine messenger said, let go of me. Didn't he want an identification? He wanted the name. He wanted the name because he knew if he had the name, he would have power over that one. And Jacob was trying to get power over whomever was wrestling him. Did he ever get the name? No. No. And that's a joy. The reason that we're told that this one has a name that he only knows himself is it indicates that no one, no one, no one has power over the risen Christ. Mm. Why do we pray in the name of Jesus? Section. Because we believe there's power in the name. John is saying he has another name after all of this that no one has any power over. Hmm. Now, John's observation that Christ's robe is dipped in blood has spawned three interpretations because, of course, it has. <laughs> Some understand the blood to be that of his enemies. We see that easily come out of Isaiah 61. If you want to read Isaiah 61, have at it. But if you didn't like Revelation, the second half of chapter 19, I'll promise you one thing. You're not going to like Isaiah 63 verses one through six either, because God is talking about how God's going to stomp all over people in a wine press at that. And their <laughs> blood is going to get all over God. Some people are like, well, this is obviously like that. And if you remember the wine press vision or not vision, but stuff going on in chapter 14, that is the second interpretation of what's going on with the wine press and the sickle and it all going crazy. We don't have to remember that or dive back into that. But there are interpretations throughout Revelation that some of the blood that we see going on is really just this tyrant God finally ripping everything apart. You can interpret it that way. Others see the blood to be that of the martyrs, as in the third interpretation of the sickle kind of thing, which was the one that we went with. The martyrs are the ones being it. Maybe it's the blood of the martyrs. It is on the robe of Christ. Now, as would be expected, most scholars think that the robe is dipped in Christ's own sacrificial blood, as were the blood or the robes of the redeemed in chapter 7, verse 14, because his rib robe, robe is dipped in blood before battle, the first interpretation is already garbage. Jesus' robe was bloody, not because of him slaying his enemies but something to do with the slain of the martyrs and his own slain. His robe is bloody because the violence done to him and to those who follow him was still obvious. Christ is also called the word of God. We all know the word of God, right? We hear the mm -hmm. word of God. We're going to talk just very briefly about what the heck the word of God means, because have you ever actually heard about why anyone's called or God, Christ is called the word of God? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. We're going to do a very well, brief kind of thing. It's the, made, it's the word of God made incarnate, isn't it? I mean, that's not exactly how it's ever said in the Bible, but that's how our theologians say it. And simultaneously, what does word of God mean? Where does it come from? What's the Greek philosophical references? What's the Hebraic biblical references? Well, we're going to hear very brief. Because it's going to deepen our expression or our understanding of this important title. The Greek word logos has two basic meanings. The first is thought or reason and thereby word or and word meaning an outward expression of an inward thought. So Jesus isn't called, uh, like when you read John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That word is logos. In the beginning was the logos. The logos was toward God. It doesn't say with God, it says toward God. 
and the word was God. Um, play with what that means, but that's neither here nor there. Now, according to the Stoic philosophers, the Logos was reason with a capital R, and it pervaded the universe. It brought, that's supposed to be ration, not, not rational, not ration order, rational order and stability to the fullness of the universe. To them, the highest good, the Stoic philosophers, was to align human reason with universal reason. Meaning, can you already understand how the Stoic philosophy that was before the time of Christ can begin to be understood as Christ, even as we understand this idea that the reason, the capital R, pervaded the whole universe, bringing rational order and stability. And we're saying, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And through him, all things came into being. Without him, nothing came into being. John is using, not John of Revelation, but John of John's Gospel, is using Stoic philosophy in the first chapter to even talk about what he means by the Logos. And the idea is, our reason better you align with this Christ reason, because that's where we get these things. Now, the Hebrew term translated to speak or to communicate or word is debar. Anyone ever heard that? No. So you know logos. Everyone knows logos, right? Right. The Hebrew word for word or speak or communicate is debar. The only reason I want you to know it is because if you know the Greek, know the Hebrew, because Jesus was more familiar with the Hebrew than the Greek anyway. So the Hebrew is debar. Now, Debar Yahweh is a common biblical phrase for God's self-revelation to humanity, especially in the prophets. Now, when I say Debar Yahweh, what might you see that translated as when you're going through the prophets of the Old Testament? The word of God. The word of the Lord or the word of God. So the word of the Lord came to me, Debar Yahweh. That is over and over again. It was, through the prophets, God's self-revelation to the prophet. So when, a, when one of us now says, hey, I think the word of God came to me saying this kind of thing, to the prophets, it was a divine self-revelation that communicated God's way, whether it was through words or anything else, I do not know, but they used the divine name in the midst of doing it. Moreover, the Hebrew Bible also portrays God as speaking creation into existence. Thus, the bar is associated with the creative as well as the revelatory activity of God. And so now we see Jesus through John right here in Revelation. The Stoic philosophers are being used for word of God. The Old Testament's being used for word of God. John's gospel was probably written around the same time that John is writing Revelation even. And we see that the first of the Johannine letters is around that same time as well. So something around these Johns, they're understanding Christ as this this Stoic philosophy word and this Old Testament word, and they're bringing it all together. Now, not just that, but you and I don't know anything about the intertestimonial period and the Targums, which is an Aramaic phrase for the Hebrew, for the paraphrases of the Hebrew Bible. And often those paraphrases, every time they saw the tetragrammaton, which are those four words or four letters that make up Yahweh, a name that we should never say, and I should stop saying, a Jew would never say it. They would not even really, they'd write this out, but you would only hear them say Adonai, which is Lord. In the Aramaic intertestimonial period, was they were paraphrasing the Hebrew Bible, they substituted for the tetragrammaton the word. Mm -hmm. So God began being known at that time as Mm -hmm. the word. So at approximately the same time, a Hellenistic Jew named Philo combined Greek and Jewish thought, he's a philosopher by the way, and developing the notion of the logos as the mediator between God and the created order. So now you have Stoic philosophy, Hebraic biblical ways, intertestimonial biblical ways, and Jewish philosophy 
all suggesting that something about this Logos and Debar are working. Thus, in using the title in Revelation, John evoked an incredibly rich background of theological and philosophical thought. And I thought maybe you'd like to know some more. And if I bore the tears out of you because of that moment, I don't apologize. You still get to know it. <laughs> now, again, behind Christ, we see the armies of heaven dressed in white linen. They ride upon white horses as well. Now, John doesn't indicate whether they're angels or the redeemed. Now, the redeemed were just clothed in white linen as their wedding garment. So maybe it's the redeemed. Typically in apocalypses, however, angels compose the army, although in 14 verse 1, it could suggest otherwise, and I am kind of suggesting otherwise. Noteworthy, however, among all these things, whether it's angels or the redeemed, and I still suspect it's the redeemed, is a surprising fact that contrary to other apocalyptic texts, this army doesn't carry any weapons. <laughs> Did you notice that? No. No. Not one mention of any weapon is had except the word of God wins the victory single-handedly. And the only weapon that's ever mentioned in the entire passage is the sharp sword that comes out of Christ's mouth, which we've heard about already in Revelation. And you can see in Old Testament times, too, from Isaiah, in testimonial times and wisdom of Solomon and New Testament times in Ephesians and Hebrews. The word of God being a double-edged sword. That's the violence that's going to be done. As we've noted earlier in our study, I believe Revelation is saying evil is over only overcome by the prophetic word of God. <clears throat> The vanquishing of evil is presented in three familiar metaphors. Striking down the nations with a sharp sword. We see that. That's the prophetic word of God. Is this a sharp sword that we're going like this? Or is this a sword of Christ's mouth? And what happens when Christ speaks? All sorts of things. We also saw that, that he'll be ruling them with an iron rod. I, that's the second time that I have been frustrated with the way that we've translated the Bible. The word in Greek is shepherding, not ruling. And hmm. there's a huge difference between shepherding and ruling. Is yeah. there not? Yes. Yes. So this one will be shepherding them <laughs> with a rod of iron. Now, the treading of the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, we played with that imagery already in 14, and I'm already past time, so if you want to dive into that again, go back to 14. But again, not as violent as we all wanted to make out to believe at first, nor definitely not coercive. This is still suggesting a seductive form of power, the power of love, strangely. Now, the first title revealed in 1714, or the first time the title was revealed in 1714, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, so in reverse order, it's now said to be inscribed on his robe and on his thigh. Did you notice that it was robe and thigh? And doesn't mm -hmm. that seem strange? Why is he having titles inscribed on his robe and thigh? And we're going to think maybe this has to do with the absolute sovereignty written in both places, because the robe is dipped in blood, recalling his sacrificial death. So he's king of kings and lord of lords. And that's his sacrificial death kind of way of demonstrating it. And maybe it's on his thigh because that's a typical place where a sword rests in Roman times. And the sword is the Roman symbol for power and authority. And so if Christ is king of king and lord of lords, and it's demonstrating both on his garment that is the symbol of a sacrificial death and on his side that is a symbol of power and authority to the ancient world. He is king of king and lord of lords in every which known way. Now, the angel watching all of this was so certain of this victory, which again should make sense since the victory was going to take place in a day and then an hour, like boom, boom, boom. The angel is really certain about this and so invites birds to feed on the bodies of the slain. And if you want to read more about God talking about that in ways that make you cringe, read Ezekiel 39. It might be more fun to you than uh, Isaiah 63 if you want to get into awful Old Testament things. I invite you to it. Now, this is the great supper of God. This 
contrasts very much with the supper of the wedding of the lamb that we see just a couple of verses beforehand. The universal scope of victory is seen in heaping up of the names in 1918. And you can just kind of see to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses, the riders, flesh of all, both free and slave, both small and great. Boy, let's heap up every name we can think about. This is how intense the victory will be, complete the victory will be, universal the victory will be. Everything is going to be eaten. The beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled for battle. And immediately the beast and the false prophets, not prophets, but prophet. There's only one false prophet in the story, uh, even though there's actually more, but there's uh, symbolic. Are captured and thrown in the lake of fire. We'll see more of the lake of fire in chapter 20, verse 14. They're thrown in the lake of fire. Da, 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 da. They're gone, they're done, they're burned up. Now the rest of the kings of the earth and their armies fall to the sword of Christ's mouth. Remember this, they're falling to the sword of Christ's mouth. Do you believe that the sword of Christ's mouth is going to slaughter the whole of the world? Yeah. And what does that mean? Because the graphic symbolism results in, of course, two very different readings. According to one reading, the grotesque reading, and it's a description of the destruction of evildoers. They're killed and their bodies are left in the battle field for scavenger birds. Certainly the most literal reading, or at least it appears that way, until we remember that the sword of Christ's mouth doesn't actually kill anybody by violence. So according to the other reading, the word of prophecy, the very thing that verse 10 at the end says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, that spirit of prophecy, that word of prophecy, that sword may actually be what results in the conversion of unbelievers. They are, quote, slain by the good news and the birds eat their flesh. This is, again, a term that Paul uses a lot to describe our sinful nature. And this this interpretation, people are saved from themselves and the flesh that is eaten is what made them bad. So now all of a sudden they're not so bad. This so is a version of salvation. What's that? So it's not the end? Oh, we're not at the end yet. No, this might be the end of their bad self. But uh, okay, this is maybe their redemption. Hmm. We want all the bad things to die. If the only thing that's slain is Christ's mouth, let's remember how Christ has slain us. Have you ever felt convicted by Jesus? Yes. What's it mean to be convicted by Jesus? have you ever felt convicted by jesus in such a way that a part of you died hmm. and if you haven't then i recommend that you spend some more time with them because what happens when you spend time with jesus do you get to stay the same way you've always been no no what happens when you spend time with Jesus for real? What happens if we were actually to follow him? Not just go to church so we're marking off our spiritual boxes for the day and being like, what good Christians we are. But actually follow Jesus. What happens when you walk along with Jesus? Do you get to stay the same? No. No. What happens? You're transformed. Parts of you die. Has anyone ever been humiliated by God, I know that's an odd thing. Let me change this. I'm not going to ask any questions of you because maybe it's too hard. So I'm going to be the negative example. God has beat me up. First time it happened was my first year of seminary. I hated my first year of seminary. I hated with every fiber of my being. I hated the people who were there and I hated the fact that I had to be there. And I decided to stop going. 
two months I didn't go to classes. I didn't go to classes once for the last two months. So I, there's a big chunk of knowledge that I'm not, don't have from that first year of seminary. I've learned it since, don't worry. And you know, the only thing I gained from deciding that I was gonna do it on my own and do what kind of life I wanted I was humiliated and humbled. Have you ever been humbled by God? Yep. Yes. What's it like to be humbled by God? Is it pleasant? No. no, my last stop, my last church was a humbled by God moment. My first church is growing out of control. The denominations trying to figure out ways to mimic what we did there so they can do it other places. There's voices in my ear telling me that my trajectory is to go be in the biggest steeple churches in our denomination and to be this kind of famous preacher. And you know what? It sounded good. And so I went to the next stop that was supposed to be a lot bigger. They told me it was a church of about 800 to 850. I show up to the church of about 500, more realistically, like 400. But you know how it goes. And I was like, that's all right. I'm going to make this work. The whole thing was tiring and exhausting. I only wanted to leave the ministry in the midst of it. God humbled me. And what happens when God humbles you? What happens when God humbles me? Is it fun? Not for one moment. It's exhausting. It's terrifying. I hate it. Can I just be someone who's normal and not have God trying to tell me all the time whom I'm supposed to be? So I will say this. When I read this part about kings and whatever else, and the, the violence being done to them. I understand the violence of God. And if we don't understand it, if you don't understand it, you haven't walked with Jesus enough. And if you don't think the disciples understood it, let's think about it for a moment. Do you ever feel like Peter experienced great violence done to him because of Jesus? Yes. yes. This is a guy who got called Satan. You don't call someone Satan if you're Jesus. How many times did Jesus call anyone Satan? One time that we can think of. This is a guy who Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times before a cock crows. As he's telling him how you're going to go. With no, he was humbled over and over and over again. Peter was humbled by Jesus. Why was Peter humbled by Jesus? Any guesses? Or am I already too late and I should shut up and let you go? No, he had to. Peter well, had to figure out how to walk with, walk like Christ. And I, if you're to, not walking like Jesus, there's pieces of you left to die. Yeah. And God will kill them for you. And how does God usually kill them for you? From the inside out? Inside out. And always comes from words. You know what is still the most terrifying thing I've ever read in the scriptures? I was 18 years old when I read it. I was tired of dealing with fundamentalists trying to tell me I wasn't a Christian. And I finally read that part too. And it struck me and it struck me ever since. And it's always made me terrified of the way I live because it is a double-edged sword. When Jesus tells the rich young ruler, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. Yeah. I haven't sold everything I have and given it to the poor and followed Jesus. And I know there's pieces that I have not given up and they will be taken from me. I know it. And the reason that I got a lot of hope is because the, when I read that, I read it in Mark's gospel. And Mark's gospel, as the guy is walking away, or before the guy is walking away, it says, and Jesus loved him. You ever wonder why I focus so much on love? It's because of that passage. I know I'm not perfect. I know God is going to rip more things away from me because God rips things away from me in an effort to, I can... What's it like to be purified by fire? Does anyone like being burned? No. Do we like what grace does to it? Grace isn't just like, oh, I'm okay. It's painful. It's costly. 
The violence we see here, we can look at violence or we can recognize that this is the sword. There's only one weapon mentioned on the side that wins. And that's a weapon that we all who are Christians should understand well because we have been cut by it. And if we haven't been cut by it, then we need to stop looking at the specks in our neighbor's eye because there's planks hanging out of our own. Anyway, what I love though, there are only two things I see thrown in that lake of fire so far. The beast and the false prophet. The flesh of others is consumed. Paul says, I'm weak in the flesh, but what's going to get rid of that for me? Maybe Jesus will. It'll suck. But the life that you have thereafter, for instance, let me try this again. I had a hard time in my last stop. It was a time of great humility. I did not like being humbled. I hate being humbled. It sucks. I, lo- I could have lost so many things. I recognize I had a problem with alcohol through all of that kind of situation. A problem with a lot of other things as well. And had I not gone through all of that, I would not be sitting all with you here right now, having that conversation where I can speak honestly, feel so much more humble and recognize that in the midst of me doing smaller things with as best as I can, that I'm encountering God in truer ways than I ever have before. I, the most painful times of my life that I have put myself through and I blame God for have always made sure that the rest of my life is only better for it. And I think that's what's going on with the kings. That's what's going on with the sailors, the horses, the whole nine yards of things. The violence we see is the purification that the sword from Christ's mouth brings. And I, for one, have experienced that. I've experienced its pain and I've experienced its glory. And the only way I experience it is with gratitude, even if in the moment I might want to shout out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm going to pray by saying, thank you, God, amen. (laughs) Any other questions that I can pontificate answers that sound like sermons? No. Three chapters left, y'all. You're doing a good job. Are we going to have a graduation ceremony? No. <laughs> no pizza no. party? Yeah, your graduation will be judges. <laughs> <laughs> Although after we're done, um, we will have uh, probably one final time where we kind of try to talk about the fullness of the book to put it together. Um, And then I will have to take off a couple of weeks to prepare uh, because I I can't fly right into judges without some prep work first. Um, So bless you. But thank you for your time, y'all. All All right, Garrett. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, Garrett. What's for supper? Take care. (laughs) I have no idea. I certainly hope it's good because I'm hungry. (laughs) God bless you. God bless you all. God bless you. God bless.